Hello, LinkedIn, and thanks again for watching Next Play, the series that focuses on athletes and their transition to second careers outside of sports. Today, we have another athlete turned doctor joining us as we focus on guests who are on the front lines of the fight against COVID-19. That guest is Dr. Mark Hamilton, a former Major League Baseball player who played with the St. Louis Cardinals and won a World Series ring with the 2011 team. In April, Hamilton achieved another career high. He was one of many students who graduated early from Hofstra's School of Medicine. That accelerated graduation allows him to join the fight against the current pandemic in an area that has been considered the epicenter of the disease outbreak, New York. Let's welcome to the show, Dr. Mark Hamilton. Hey Joe, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. All right, so I think we should explain for the public exactly why that accelerated graduation took place um, we saw a lot of students, not only from Hofstra, but a lot of other medical schools have that type of early graduation. Why exactly did that happen? Sure. Yeah, I mean, the thing was, you know, you mentioned in the kind of intro about New York and the number of people that were in New York, the number of cases, I think it was broadcast, you know, nationwide and internationally. But the big concern was that what happens if the healthcare workers get sick? If the healthcare workers get sick, who's going to take care of them? Who's going to take care of the doctors and nurses if and when they do get infected with this pandemic? So ultimately, Governor Cuomo decided that the best opportunity would be to take the New York medical graduates or the classes of 2020 and graduate us a month early. Ultimately, we were very lucky. We avoided a lot of that. There are definitely some tragic stories out there with healthcare workers becoming ill and, and some passing away. But overall, you know, the the working class within the medical community did very well and, and was able to stay pretty healthy during this. But we were ready at a moment's notice to be injected because we had already graduated and received our degrees. And so let's actually talk about that progress that New York has made. Long Island is already in phase two of reopening businesses. Uh, New York City just yesterday reached uh, zero hospitalizations, which I believe is the first time since the I know. Uh, started. Um, how does that affect your outlook as you begin your post-school career? Yeah, I think the answer to that is it's cautiously optimistic. Um, you know, one of the big things about what we've seen with other states reopening is that the case numbers begin to come back and that there can be an influx of new cases. I think what we need to do is make sure that we take it slow, that we do things in a right and appropriate, responsible progression in order to limit this bouncing back. I know there's also a lot of talk and, and discussion about, you know, whether humidity could be, uh, you know, help decrease the viral transmission that's being researched right now. And, and some of the other factors during the summer and in warmer weather that may, you know, decrease the number of respiratory illnesses in general, including COVID. But ultimately, what we have to see is that we don't kind of overstep our, you know, our timing. If we get out ahead of this too much, if it gets, you know, too many new cases, in a short amount of time, we could be right back where we were, which is the last thing we want. Mm. And so can you compare uh, what your current plans, I guess, for the summer looks like now because there's a pandemic in play versus sure. what you were expecting? Like wh wh exactly what was your timetable supposed to be? Let's say if you graduated in May, when were you expecting to start residency? So, you know, I, like I kind of mentioned, it, Fortunately, we weren't needed to come in right away, uh, at least not in the MD capacity. I know there are a lot of people, you know, we had people that some people volunteered to go into different hospitals and different roles. Um, ultimately, for me, it was more waiting and watching the news. I kept, you know, on my toes and, and up, up to date with the medical information, with publishings, with the journal articles that were coming out about how to stay protected, about how the virus was being transmitted. Um, but at the same time, it's not going to actually start me any earlier. If I would have graduated in May, I would have started in this next couple of weeks anyway, which is kind of the standard start date for medical residents in their first year is, is in July or, or late June. We're starting June 25th. Um, I think it still does change some things for me. We still have a lot of cases. The numbers are definitely down, but I think that I went from being prepared to deal with the things you normally see in the hospital, you know, skin infections, uh, pneumonias, heart attacks, uh, COPD patients, stuff like that, to being very aware that a large percentage of what I'm going to be doing is still going to be with COVID patients, even if we are, you know, significantly down in numbers. Hmm. So let's talk about how you got here. It's not every day that you meet a doctor who was a former professional athlete. Why medicine? Why did you choose that as your second act? Sure. 
you know, my, my dad has been, you know, he's a physician. He is a pathologist and currently the head of pathology at City of Hope in LA. And he's been a prolific researcher in cancer and oncology for decades now. And I remember when I was very, very young, you know, the stuff that he was talking about, tumor genetics, uh, protein expression of, of different tumors and, and how they could be exploited for new therapies, new chemotherapies, even, you know, discussing the evolution of immunotherapies before we even had them. Uh, he was at Johns Hopkins for a while and then MD Anderson for a while. So he's been a heavy researcher. And, and I grew up in that environment, really seeing a real stimulating medical experience. And he would take me into the hospital. I'd get to see his pathology lab. And he was always very forthcoming with his work. So from a very young age, what I wanted to do was become a doctor and enter medicine and, and potentially be involved in oncology, kind of following his footsteps. Obviously, baseball got in the way of that for a little yeah. while. Right. Um, you know, which was great. It was an incredible experience. And, and to get to play in the major leagues taught me so much that I can take forward into my medical career. Um, but at the same time, this was always the plan as, as the second act. And I mm -hmm. always said that, you know, at 30, if I wasn't on a major league roster with kind of a everyday role where I knew that I'd have an extended contract, I was going to retire and go back. And even after, if I had played longer, I was still anticipating returning and, and eventually going to med school. So let's actually talk about some of those lessons, because I, I think the uh, normal, let's say, paradigm for anybody that's going into med school, someone uh, practices a pre-med track in college, then they go sh straight into med school. Some, a lot of students do it that way. But you had this amazing experience where you're on the big, sh uh, big stage, the show, as they call it. How did that affect the way you look at your current career? What sure. are those lessons that you took from your playing career into sure. your medical career? I, mean, I think there's a lot of lessons. One of the big things is just being put in a situation where now I'm a little bit older. Um, you know, I, and that's kind of ironic mm. to say that because, you know, obviously in the, in the hindsight, you also say, well, it's it shortened your medical career. But by coming into medicine a little bit older, I was a little more mature, mm. I was a little more stable in my life. I'm, you know, married with two kids now, and, and, and I feel like I'm in a very different life stage than I was when I was, say, 25. Mm. Um, but at the same time, baseball really taught me one, how to handle pressure, how to handle constant observation, how to handle scrutiny. It also taught me how to handle myself when I wasn't, you know, under the watchful eye. Uh, you spend a lot of time when you're off the field and you got to make sure that you, you know, maintain your rapport with the team. You don't want to be, you know, having trouble or difficulties off the field. So it taught me a lot of life lessons about how to balance work with, you know, life outside. In addition to that, you know, it taught me a lot about work ethic. I saw even at the top level when you you know you get to the major leagues. I think a lot of people kind of you know think of these people as almost superheroes. You know they that they just kind of fall out of bed in the morning, walk into the ballpark, and you know start you know ripping line drives or throwing 100 mile an hour fastballs. And the reality is that's not not how it is in professional sports. Those guys work incredibly hard, especially at the top level. They're students of the game. They're constantly looking at film. They're constantly working on their bodies and, and all the aspects of their life that can influence and, and help them be a better ball player. So I think that really taught me a lot about medicine. It's, it's not a destination to become a doctor. It's not enough. You have to continue to improve and strive to you know better yourself once you're there. And, and that's really inspiring. I think a great message that I learned. Mm. And for joy those just joining us, we have Dr. Mark Hamilton with us today, a former Major League Baseball player who's now a doctor. Uh, thanks for John joining in. Thanks to Miriam. Thanks to Claudette. And thanks to Christine, who says this is an impressive journey, Mark. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you. you know, I want to get back to you saying that it was always in your plans uh, to become a doctor, which is pretty amazing uh, in, in, in itself. I'm curious, you know, once you are at Tulane, you're already a highly rated prospect. Mm -hmm. You get drafted in 26, uh, 2006, one of the top 100 picks. I think that at that point, someone could think baseball is a sure thing for me. Um, this is what my career is going to be. How Are you balancing two ambitions at once at that time? Or did it get to a point where you had the blinders on and you were only thinking about baseball? You know, honestly, it was a little bit of both. I think while I was in college, you know, definitely I was a prospect. Definitely it was one of those things that, you know, professional baseball was in front of me. Um, but at the same time, wanting to do this and knowing what it takes, knowing how difficult it is to get into medical school, knowing the amount of work and, and effort that it takes to do this, I definitely had a, you know, career path that I wanted to pursue. 
whenever baseball ended. And whether that was at 25, whether it was at 18, even prior to college, or whether that was, you know, at 30, where it ended up. So for me, I, I studied molecular biology uh, at Tulane University for my first three years. I made sure that I was doing well in my classes. I was working hard and, and learning a lot. And then I took that and, you know, focused on baseball, making sure that I could have a professional career. I think that really helped me when I came back, because then if anything, you know, you talk about the blinders. I really had my blinders on to be a doctor. Uh, when I returned to classes, you know, at the end of my career was the first time that I didn't have any other distractions or any other things to consider, you know, as far as sports or outside. Uh, and that was really when I could put the blinders on it and go after that. But, you know, obviously when I was in my career within baseball, uh, I think once I left Tulane, it was it was blinders on for the time being. But this was always in the back of my mind. Hmm. So now we talked about your start the start of your professional career. Let's talk about the end of it, because I'm always curious how that internal discussion goes when you decide that it's time to try something new. And I saw in one interview that you had with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch that you had a conversation with your wife. When that point comes, what is that conversation like? What are you factoring in? What are the emotions involved? Could you give us a little window inside that decision? Yeah, I mean, it's. I think the reason it was easier for me is probably the timing. The timing worked out very well. Uh, basically I went through my career. I played with, you know, St. Louis in the major leagues in 2010, 11. And I had seen guys run through this kind of minor league free agent game before I had seen the guys in front of me. I had been paying attention to that. And what I typically saw was, you know, guys sometimes finish up their first contract, a draft contract. It's usually a seven year contract out of, uh, you know, out of college. And once they finish that, you either have options left or you don't. And this is kind of the semantics of the, of the way the baseball draft works. But you have three option years where they can bring you up and down from the major leagues as many times as they want. They can put you back in AAA and they can bring you up again. And after those three option years are expired, a team that has you on their major league roster, if they do want to send you back to the minor leagues, they have to allow you to go through what's called waivers, where any other team can pick you up for basically nothing. And a lot of teams don't want to do that. So they won't bring a guy up unless they're planning on keeping them up for a long duration. So if, you know, that minor injury comes up, you might not be the one that's called if you're a minor league free agent, despite maybe having a great year. So I'd seen guys kind of go through that game a little bit. And I even knew about it before, you know, before when I first got drafted. So my wife and I sat down when I first got drafted and said, you know, how long are we going to give this? Unlike a lot of other sports where you go directly into the top league, baseball has a minor league system. Guys float around, you know, for a very long time playing professionally without ever necessarily making it. And we kind of set 30 as the goal. We said, look, you know, if somebody is not established in the major leagues at 30, the likelihood that they become established after that is extremely low. And at 30, I would still have plenty of time left in my life to go to medical school, and have like a very meaningful career, you know, both in, you know, clinical medicine and research if I wanted it. So that was kind of our cutoff date. But you bring up the conversation, the conversation is really interesting. Despite all the planning, you know, it hurts. And it's kind of like losing a part of you in a way, you know, you spend my entire childhood, and you know, most of my adolescence and all of my 20s playing professional baseball and, and baseball, you know, as a young kid. And then suddenly, it's really coming to an end. Um, but at the same time, I knew that I had something I wanted to do afterwards, which was very comforting. And then I kind of mentioned the timing of it too. The timing of it worked out great because, you know, when I played my final games with the Braves and I was done, I was able to enroll in classes immediately. I think I was in classes less than 10 days later. Mm -hmm. And if it had been a little bit later on that, you know, my contract with the Braves ended, maybe classes had already started and maybe, you know, when I'm talking to my agent and they say, Hey, we're going to talk to some teams about getting you spring training next year. It's a little more tempting when I can't go back immediately and I'm kind of losing a year there. Mm. So it really worked out for me. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I want to give a shout out to some of the people that are watching Abdullah who says, I agree. Athletes do have transferable skills. Esther who says nature versus nurture. This is a great example of your strengths and influences from your father's career. Thank you for sharing and inspiring us and others. And we have a very interesting comment from Amy, who says, very well said, I'm a 46-year-old NP student. I'm guessing that's nurse, nurse practitioner. And I love seeing others that devote to medicine a little older with a greater appreciation for the work and dedication required, especially when our brains are no longer sponges like when we were 20. <laughs> uh, Good point. Uh, you know, th there's another story that sticks out to me about how you met one of your professors uh, at Hofstra 
uh -huh. at Hofstra School of Medicine, and he described you as having a presence in the room when he first met you. Uh, and, you know, there's been a lot of athletes I've talked to about their second act, their second yeah. careers. Are you aware that when you go into a new world that you have this presence? Is that something that you knew or something that you learned from the way that someone like your professor talked about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is something about athletes in general. I mean, it, it's both, you know, athletic people, tall people, they kind of can command a room sometimes. But I, I, there's also a, you know, people that have played in front of a lot of fans and, and under a lot of scrutiny have a, a little bit different air to them. Um, I think it can be a really good thing. You, what you don't want it to do is, is be a distraction to other people or be in the way. Uh, I think it's really benefited me more than anything because it can be a big icebreaker for people sometimes. There's a lot of sports fans out there. Sometimes, you know, you're working with a different physician or, or somebody that you want to be able to help you, you know, in your education and your, in your work. And if you find common ground with them, uh, whether it's just simply the fact that I'm a little bit closer to them in age sometimes, the fact that I have kids, I bring that up a lot of times with, you know, uh, different attendings that, that have children as well to kind of, you know, just find a common ground with them and connect with them because people are much more likely to help you, to educate you, to involve you if they feel like they have something to share with you and that, and that there's that kind of uh, mutual, you know, mutual ground there. So let's go to some of the questions from our audience members again. Thanks for chiming in and keep uh, uh, contributing to the stream. Let's go to Elizabeth, who says, as you were studying the sciences, did this influence your understanding about your own health and injury prevention? Absolutely. I, there's no question. I, I think that's, you know, that's kind of one of the benefits of, of being interested in medicine much, much earlier than baseball. Uh, I, I know there are some stories of people out there that you know, they're going through their careers and then they find an interest and they decide, hey, I'm going to pursue this later. <clears throat> you know, being young, being kind of curious and, and hungry for the information, hungry for the knowledge. I definitely looked into things. I looked into, you know, how to change my diet, how to, you know, incorporate supplements that would help me, um, how to prevent injuries, how to benefit there. And, and I think that, you know, the whole idea of understanding or having a basic understanding at the time of, of physiology, pharmacology that I had learned from my undergraduate studies was an enormous benefit uh, in my baseball career to really get me through some some difficult times and kind of optimize my performance. Mm. Uh, let's go to another question. Andy says, what were your weakest academic subjects? What did you really have to work on? Um, you know, I, I'll tell you, when I went back, it was math. Uh, I had a snafu. When I went through undergraduate the first time I took calculus, uh, calculus is one of the courses that you have to take uh, in order to, to apply to medical school or take the MCATs typically. Um, I took it my first time around and did extre extremely well. And it actually is one of my stronger subjects. But then you go through nine years of not doing any math, really, other than calculating your batting average and your OPS. And that changes things a little bit. And I went back, my credits didn't transfer uh, back into my degree. And I had to retake calculus, uh, you know, freshman long calculus with um, with some very smart people and a very difficult professor. And I think that was probably, you know, probably one of the hardest things for me. Mm. Uh, and thank you to Robert and Daniel and Rose and everybody that's, that's watching. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about is what you're going to do in the future now. I believe you have six years of res residency yeah. ahead of you. Another, uh, another minor leagues in a way, right? Right, exactly. Um, you know, how does... How are you anticipating that experience being like? Do you know what to expect, um, or is it just something that you're completely going blind into? I'm, I'm, I doubt that that's the case. Yeah, you know, in a way, I know what to expect, but at the same time, I think it would be foolhardy to say I know what I'm in for. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you talk to the other residents, you've met them, you've dealt with them whenever you're in your clinical rotations, which are the last two years of medical school. And also I've talked a lot to my dad and obviously he was, you know, a medical resident in a much different era than now. Uh, they had paper records, which was an enormous difference. The hours weren't, you know, weren't quite as lenient as they are now. They were a little bit worse for him. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like I'm definitely prepared. I'll say that. I think that's the best answer I can give is that I feel prepared. I feel like, you know, my school, the Zucker School of Medicine and Hofstra Northwell was fantastic. Uh, they armed me with the knowledge that I need and the work ethic. And, and they really put me in touch with wonderful clinicians at Northwell who will be able to help me in my career. Um, but, you know, I, to anticipate what residency is really going to be like is 
you know, kind of like trying to anticipate what pro baseball was going to be like before mm -hmm. that. You have a vision of what it's going to be, but it's never going to match up. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you to Masoom for watching, who says, I think I found my role model. I guess you have a fan, Mark. Uh, and Okuchi, who says, I feel motivated on behalf of my son. He wants to play in the NBA and also would like to be a doctor. He is 6'10 at 16 years. Tell him to do it. Yeah, listen, uh, do it. it sounds like there's multiple things that he can do. Yeah, I, I, mean, was, I, had, I had a role model growing up. My dad would always tell me, you know, when I was young and I said, I want to play baseball, I want to become a doctor. It, it was one of those things that I think a lot of parents would just kind of potentially say, yeah, OK, you know, best of luck yeah. with that. And mm. maybe they foster it, but at the same time, they may not know how to foster it in the right way. And what my dad did an extraordinary job of um, was giving me a role model in it, which was a guy named Dr. Bobby Brown. He mm. played third base for the New York Yankees and he went to Tulane Medical School. He eventually was the president of the American League for a little while and he was a practicing cardiologist for 30 years. And having that story of, you know, that person to look to and say, it's been done right. and it can be done, I think is really powerful for a young kid. And I mean, even at eight years old, I remember saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'll be the next one that does that. Mm. And on a really interesting note, Tulane medical alumni actually reached out to me a few weeks ago and put me in touch with Dr. Brown, who's now in his mid nineties. And I got to have a nice conversation with him. And I mean, to go first full circle like that was incredible. That sounds like an amazing story. I have one last question from an audience member. Please. Well, a pretty simple one. How are you taking care of your mental health at this time? So uh, to take care of my mental health, you know, I think I've been doing a few things. One is spending a lot of time with my girls. I have two young daughters, nine and six, Lillian, or yeah, nine and six, about to turn 10, Lillian and Madison, spending time with my wife, Lauren, who's, you know, just my rock and she's fantastic. Uh, I definitely couldn't be here without them. Um, and, you know, I definitely, you know, now that, the, that there's been a little bit warmer weather, I've hit the golf course a few times. I think it's a, it's a pretty social distance sport. You go out and walk a little bit and, and you know, I've, I've played golf. That's kind of my athletic refuse, uh, you know, my refuge since stopping baseball. Um, so really, I've just been trying to, you know, enjoy the time that I've had with them. The quarantine in general has been very difficult. It's very difficult for everybody, but this has been some really quality time with my children that, you know, otherwise I wouldn't have gotten. Either they would have been in school um, or I would have been busy and, and we just wouldn't have had this one on one time. So I think, you know, it's really given me a little bit of a mental break, a time to reflect on what's going on in the world and how I can help benefit it when I'm, you know, in the position I'm going to be in here in about a, a week. Or so uh, so it's it's been good. Mm. And. Again, thank you to everybody that was joining us. Claudette says, I love that you don't look at your life as one dimensional. And Allison says, I think it's amazing that you notice that it's never too late for a second career. Never um, too late. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for sharing your story with us. Sure thing. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, Joe. And again, thank you for everyone who watched today. Join us again next Thursday as we speak to another athlete turned doctor. Uh, thanks for tuning in.